Let's now start taking a look at transistors. Transistors are three terminal devices and they can be used as either amplifiers or switches. Like all semiconductor devices, they're nonlinear and the transistor has at least three main regions of operation. So in terms of complexity, there's a little more to it than the diode and it does take a little more effort to understand how these devices work. Um, Fortunately, simple models do exist for each region of operation, and so we'll still be able to use linear models with linear equations. And uh, so technically, um, doing calculations and things like that will be very straightforward. So what does a transistor look like? Well, on paper, it looks like this. Uh, there are basically two flavors of what we call bipolar junction transistors the NPN and the PNP. These labels refer to how the devices are manufactured internally and we basically won't pay any attention to the PNP transistor. Uh, the PNP is important um, but at the moment we want to keep life simple and we will concentrate on just this one device. Uh, basically this device has all of the polarities reversed compared to this one. Um, and it's very easy to pick up uh, the way in, uh, PNP transistors work once we understand the NPN. So let's have a look. The, um, the, the terminals have specific labels. Um, this one here sticking out from the, uh, the, this uh, line segment is called the base. The um, other terminal without an arrow is called the collector. The terminal with an arrow is called the emitter. The arrow points in the direction of conventional current flow. For, so for the NPN transistor, uh, that's coming out of the emitter. Similarly with the PNP device, uh, the arrow points in the direction of conventional current flow. So current flows into the emitter terminal, out of the base and out of the collector. All right, now let's talk in more detail about the terminal voltages and currents that we can have because obviously what we'd like to do is to start to build up the terminal characteristics of this device um, but we have to agree on some nomenclature so here we go PN, uh, NPN transistor on the left PNP on the right we've got three terminals so we can have three currents and therefore three um, terminal voltages. Um, each of the collector and base have the current flowing into the device and the emitter has the current coming out of the device. It's pretty clear from this and Kirchhoff's current law that with these two going in and this one coming out we must have IE equals IC plus IB. This equation is always true. It's also always true for the PNP device, but the emitter current is coming in and it leaves via the base and the collector. But this fundamental equation is always true. Um, we've also got three possible terminal voltages to measure because we've got three pairs of terminals. So we have VCE, for example, the voltage from the collector to the emitter. We've got the base to the collector and the base to the emitter. Now we're going to do what we did for diodes and that is build a test circuit and investigate how the device behaves when we apply a range of voltages. But of course now we've got lots of different combinations, right? We don't have just one current and one voltage, we've got three currents and three terminal voltages. Fortunately other people have already done all the hard work and figured out which of the particular combinations of currents and voltages are important and we won't try and reproduce their work, we'll just use it. So let's have a look at the test circuit for determining the what we call the input terminal characteristic. Here it is, we've got the transistor sitting in the middle here, our NPN transistor. Uh, the base is connected via this resistor to VBB, which is a variable DC voltage source. And 
this voltage source goes between zero and some positive value. In the collector circuit, the collector terminal is connected via this resistor RC to this fixed voltage source here. And what we call the input terminal characteristic is a graph of the base current versus the base emitter voltage. So we're, we're, uh, from now on we will be associating the base and the emitter with um, the input to the transistor. And so that's why we call it the input terminal characteristic. So once we have fixed this voltage here, VCC we call it, we're now going to um, adjust VBB over a range of values and we'll be recording the base current and the base emitter voltage and we'll be plotting it on a graph. So let's have a look at that. Now this graph will look quite familiar and it looks suspiciously like the graph for the real diode and that's because they're essentially identical. So, um, so we notice that when VBE, which is plotted along the bottom here, IB up there, uh, around about 0.5 of a volt, there's almost no current flowing. And it's not until we get to about 0.7 of a volt that we get an appreciable current flowing. So this is identical to the behavior of the real diode. When the diode is conducting, so we're somewhere up here, we say that the transistor is on or forward biased. Apart from that, there's not much to say. Okay, except in order for the transistor to conduct, we need, in a, we need VBE to be around about 0.7 of a volt, and that's when we have an appreciable bias current flowing, uh, sorry, a uh, base current flowing. All right, that's the input terminal characteristic. Fortunately, there's only one other characteristic that we need to look at, and that's concerned with the output. So we need a new test circuit now. Here it is. It looks just like the old one, except we've replaced the fixed voltage source, VCC, with a variable voltage source. Neither of these voltage sources ever go negative. They're always between zero and some positive maximum value. Now we associated IB and VBE with the input to the transistor, and we're going to associate IC and VCE with the output of the transistor. The output terminal characteristic is in fact a graph of IC versus VCE. So what do we do? Well, first of all, we adjust VBB until we get a certain current IB flowing. And then what we do is that we sweep VCC over a range of voltages, specifically from about zero up to some maximum value, maybe 20 volts or something like that. For each, for a given IB and a given VCC, we measure the current IC and the voltage VCE. And as we keep increasing VCC, we record this pair, IC, VCE, and then we draw a graph of IC versus VCE, given this value of IB. Then we go back to the beginning, we change VBB, do we get a slightly different value of IB, and then we sweep VCC all over again. And instead of just getting one curve of IC versus VCE, we get an entire family of curves, one each for a specific value of IB. And we get a very interesting result. Here is the family of curves for the output terminal characteristic. Uh, there's something funky happening down here. Um, I don't know why this line has gone all fat, but um, it's not in the electronic version and my printer has just decided to misunderstand its uh, postscript instructions. But anyway, here's our graph of IC versus VCE. Each one of these curves corresponds to a different value of IB. And in fact, 
IB increases in this direction. So IB is smaller, IB is larger. Now the interesting thing is that when we choose a particular value of IB and we start increasing VCE, um, the voltage just starts to go up, uh, sorry, the current starts to go up. But then after a while, the current curve flattens out and becomes this constant value. The same behavior if we were to change to another value of IB, this much larger value of IB, we start to increase the collected current, but then it too rolls off and stays constant. So for VCE greater than round about this value here, it's a little bit nebulous, but say around about 0.2 of a volt, IC stops increasing as a function of VCE. For VCE greater than this value, 0.2, IC is essentially independent of VCE. As you can see, the current is essentially constant no matter what we do with VCE. So this is very important. IC is independent of VCE. And in fact, the only way to change IC when we're above about VCE equals 0.2 of a volt is to change IB, which will allow us to switch between these curves. We cannot change the collector current by changing the collector voltage when we're um, operating at a VCE greater than about 0.2 of a volt. Now these voltages are quite low, right? I've only drawn it up to about 0.5 of a volt. If we extend that voltage range to a much greater uh, set of values, here is, um, here is what it looks like. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, the interesting behavior down here is, is a bit more compressed. Um, but you can see that um, the collector current stays constant over quite a wide range of VCE. So that's the terminal characteristic. Um, it's a little bit different. Um, initially, it's, uh, it seems quite weird and unfamiliar, but we will get used to it.